Hello, I'm very honored uh, to have with me today a very special guest, uh, Professor Stephen Happel. Uh, welcome, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me. Uh, it genuinely is, um, is my privilege and uh, it's such an interesting set of questions. I can't wait to start. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Uh, that's yeah. watching. <laughs> Professor Happel, uh, you're a specialist in learning environments and uh, you have your own website. Uh, dedicated to improving learning environments and for uh, every, for anyone interested the link is in the description uh, you say that uh, to learn well is complex while most people usually think of teaching and learning strategies and integrating technology in the classroom you suggest that the learning process starts in the learning environment as an expert in this field how important do you think the classroom itself is well uh, i mean it's all important really and and as you as you rightly said at the beginning learning is complex it's complex but it's not difficult all the pieces are easy you just need to do them all you know and it always amazes me that people don't spend more time on the learning environment because the gains are so substantial you know if you I go into examination rooms you know and people are working so hard to get another two or three percent yeah. they were just change the light bulbs paint the walls put in a few plants and there's five percent for everybody for nothing, you know. So I think we've neglected it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And people have talked well about the design of the space, you know, how well pretty it can look or whatever. But I'm talking here about what is effective for your brain, what makes your brain work better. You know, if you want to be your your best self, what do you need the learning environment to contribute? And it turns out a lot, really a lot. I agree. I agree. Uh, so I uh, listened to your interview on the Climate Connection uh, podcast and I was, you know, immediately drawn by your project, Bring Your Own Plant. Uh, it struck me as being a, a simple but yet very effective way to take responsibility for our, uh, our own learning environment. Can you explain to our viewers what Bring Your Own Plant involves? Yeah, and again, again it's more complicated than, than it looks, but um, uh, a lot of children in a classroom or students in any in a seminar room in a university or whatever um are, are breathing and we breathe oxygen goes in co2 goes out and it turns out that co2 is not very good for concentration so if i have you know 25 30 children in a room they are uh, gassing themselves with their own emissions you know <laughs> and co2 is a heavy gas so it it sort of slowly fills the room up from the ground upwards if you don't open doors and windows and those other things that teachers watching this will know that maybe when they've been invigilating an examination all the children are busy working they they find themselves as a teacher falling asleep at the front because the room is filling up with co2 and usually they have to stand up and walk around the room just to clear their heads you know um so we know very well documented the impact of co2 on our ability to concentrate and uh, and more. So how do we get it down? Well, <clears throat> we could spend a lot of money on you know, scrubbing the air and having um, filtration devices. You'd spend tens of thousands of euros, but a very quick way is photosynthesis. We we just need a plant, and uh, as luck would have it, um, NASA NASA is. I do some work with NASA. I got my. NASA hat here, no I haven't, but uh, um, they're going to Mars and Mars doesn't have any oxygen so they want to make sure they don't waste anything so they've thought I wonder what the best plants would be to take to Mars so they produced a list and um, folk watching this if they go to hebble.net we you provided the the link to slash BYOP bring your own plant mm -hmm. you'll see the um, the list of the best plants and basically evergreen broadleaf plants then it gets more interesting because you want about one plant per person that's enough to to do the job of keeping the oxygen levels up and we find it helps if you put the plants in a white pot why because plants are um, doing photosynthesis they absorb light to do the work of, of producing oxygen scrubbing back from the co2 and, and of course light is an important part of our learning as well so if you fill the room with with plants they oh good news lots of oxygen bad news not enough light so we put them in white pots and then 
they reflect the light back a little. It's a small thing, but it helps you to think, I think, as a student. And of course, you can you can do clever little things with little Arduino, little Arduino boxes that you just plug into the plants, and then uh, the plant can self water. Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting stem work to do. Um, you can try different nutrients on the plants. Uh, there's always a boy in the class who tries to wee on his plant, you know, <laughs> and I wonder what the effect will be. You know? <laughs> uh, but you can try different nutrients and see what works. And we find it helps to name the plants. So welcome to uh, Monica the money plant who <laughs> lives here on my desk. And hello, Monica, thank you for your help. Um, and it turns out that having your own plant uh, is quite motivating. And there's some bits we don't understand. We don't quite understand why that relationship with your plant uh, engages people more. It's about agency, I guess. But we've, we've got lots of examples where children have been poor attenders or poor behaviors. Mm -hmm. And uh, having their own plant just seems that they seem to be better, you know. And, and I mean, the, you know, people watching this, I, I guess, teachers will go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're interviewing some crazy hippie, you know. <laughs> so, ah, let's put plants or we'll be well. But if we just look at the data here, um, you know, this is this is what happened in Dubai when um, Asher Alexander, a head teacher there, put plants as a, you know, a, a big project, 162 classrooms. And I think everybody can see that the academic performance after was better than before. Green is after, blue is before, orange is after blue. But also up here, you know, so I didn't show very well. Up here, they did a sort of a detailed analysis of each student. And basically people fidgeted less, concentrated more, were more creative, were, were just better, you know. And so, you know, although it's um, like all these things we're going to talk about, they, they seem very simple and obvious, but the science behind them is quite complex. The results are very obvious. You know, if you want better learners with better results and better behavior, plants do it, you know, really simple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as, you, as I said, it's not something crazy or something that's expensive, but it's something that is proven to help a lot. Proven so to help a lot. Mm -hmm. We've got tons tons of data where we have these little boxes we put in our our classroom, our little learnometer boxes, and they measure CO2 and many other things as well. So we've got about you know three and a half million hours of data. So I'm I'm very confident about the numbers for this. There are other bits we're not so sure about. We're not quite so clear about the impact of air pressure on on learning, but we're looking at that at the moment. So, but with CO2, and and one of the questions you asked. Um, and you're a really helpful note. So thank you for sending that over. I love people who prepare. You, know. <laughs> um, you, you said, well, do we, how do we measure that? Because CO2, and it, it, you know, CO2 monitors, the, the CO2 sensor in here on its own costs over 60 euros. Um, so you can buy cheap CO2 measures, but they're useless. They don't, they're not at all accurate. But actually, if you just walk in the room, you can feel the difference. A room that's full of CO2 feels hot, your skin feels slightly clammy. You know, you can feel, and people perhaps, um, they're familiar with air travel. When when they open the door of the aircraft and you go out, yeah. you can feel the difference. <laughs> and uh, it's enough, you know. So with some hard numbers, you're trying to get the CO2 down to less than 1,000 parts per million ppm. And uh, if I tell you that five years ago, or maybe seven years ago, people thought it should be should be better than 2,200 parts per million. So the more research people do, the lower that figure comes. There's a paper came out of Harvard last year that suggested it should be as low as 700. So CO2 is bad for you. And uh, yeah, but we, we say get it under a thousand, and you'll be cooking with gas. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it, there are there are, uh, there's also this side that's affordable, right? To have all these types of uh, um, you know research and uh, things like that, it's still not something that uh, needs to cost a lot of money. No, no and indeed, I'd I'd go further with that, and and 
and say, you know, actually, if it does cost a lot of money, it's not much point in doing the research because many schools around the world just don't have much money. And we we found, I mean, just to be quite um, quite aggressive about that, we found that the tighter the budget, very often the better the learning, because you have to make choices. You you know, if you've got all the money in the world, if you're a wealthy school Eton, you know, in London, they can have anything they like. They end up having too much. And when you have to choose, then there's a conversation to be had with children and the students. And they say, uh, well, you know, maybe we don't do this or we do do that. And in choosing, you have to reflect on your learning. And it's that metacognition, it's that learning about learning that proves to be important as well. So it's really important that the children and the teachers are part of that conversation about what should we do, you know, really, really matters. Yeah. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, we got not only cognitive benefits, but also behavior changes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, um, I guess, again, it's a lot of this is common sense with data. <laughs> and uh, so we were we were um, working in a little school just down the road from here. Actually, although I have projects all around the world, we're lucky enough to be working a few miles away. And it's a coastal school wasn't doing very well it's sort of coasting along and I said to the head teacher it was lovely um, lady, I said Susie what's what's the which class in the school is coasting the most you know so <laughs> by the coast coasting school coasting class and went into the children so well, let's measure let's measure your room and the first thing I asked them was you know coming up to lunchtime who are the children in here who are you know, struggling to stay focused, who are, you know, starting to fall off their chair a bit, or, you know, throwing their pencil, or pick up my pen, you know, fidgeting. And um, not that there's anything wrong with movement, we'll maybe come to later, but just they kind of lost their focus. And um, a group of boys in the corner pointed at themselves, says, it's us, you know, and all the other children in the room said, it's them, it's them over there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody knew, you know. And I said, and who are the... Who are the children? They were all boys, by the way. And I said, well, who are the children who, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they don't want to finish. Like, Mum's waiting outside. Hang on, Mum, just working on my dinosaur, you know. And, uh, you know, kind of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, as my grandmother would have said, you know. And they all pointed to a, another group of boys and girls. So when we looked at where they were, the, the boys and girls were sitting by in a corner by a window. The, the glass was broken, so there was good fresh air coming in there was lovely light coming in from the window it was quite cool because often learning is too hot you don't want to go above 23 18 to 23 degrees is about best for learning and they just happened to be in the best possible place the boy the naughty boy corner <laughs> uh, was too hot too dark there was no circulation the co2 was over 2000 parts per million and nobody nobody could concentrate so i swapped them over so let's sit in each other's seats for a bit. By two o'clock, one of the girls called me over and said, um, so she's gone from being, you know, in the shiny corner to the naughty boy corner. She said, I, I can feel myself going over to the dark side. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful phrase. And it was just the room standing in the way of her learning. And so then we, we big project, we reconfigured the whole room. We painted it, we changed the light bulbs put in plants, we organised the rooms that they had to move around a bit. And the teacher that had had the class the year before came in to look at them and she said, I, I don't recognise the children. Well, obviously, I know who they are, but I never saw them be like this the whole year. So, you know, teachers watching this, this isn't just a little change. This is really big, profound changes. And, you know, a lot of teachers will worry about noise, for example, and they'll think, Oh, what do I do if the classroom's a bit too noisy? You know, how do I manage getting the noise down? And yeah, we found if you simply say to the children, "Look, here's a here's a decibel meter. Try and keep the class under. Well, try and keep the decibel meter out of the orange zone um, during the morning. If class gets a bit noisy, these two. This is in Islington, in London. These two kids will walk around and just say, look." Sure, have a look at the meter. So we've found if you give the students the data, 
they will respond to it when when you don't give them the data they'll just be you know, be a bit noisy kids are noisy you know but they when they know that noise stops them learning i mean you need a bit of noise dead silence is pretty hopeless but they too much noise you know and and by the way if they could stay out of the orange zone all morning they get to go to lunch five minutes early so there's a there's a good reward there as well you know so all this is really lots of little things what the sporting crowd call the aggregation of marginal gains lots and lots of little things all adding up to make a big difference so well, let me put those um put those guys away <laughs> mm -hmm. so from what i understood uh plants uh, good ventilation and light have an impact on the test results as well yeah light especially is um uh, um a lot of teachers uh, if they teach in the same classroom often have a real headache by friday mm -hmm. and it's very often it's the fluorescent lights in the ceiling they flicker and your your brain is aware of the flicker but your eyes don't notice it so your brain says something's moving but your eyes say well i can't see anything and your body turns that into stress so they get very stressed whereas if you replace the lights with led bulbs they use less electricity they're better but again it's not just led bulbs you want bulbs come with a with a, um, a whiteness value so uh, which is a kelvin value k-e-l-v-i-n kelvin value so if you buy a light bulb have i got a box of light bulbs here no i don't think i have but if you if you buy a light bulb it'll give you a kelvin value and say mm. you know you want the kelvin value of five thousand or above five thousand or above and that's very white mm. but if i turn on this light here it's too yellow um but if i turn on this light over here it's a little lighter and it feels more like daylight you, you don't even notice the light coming on but so you want and again you can measure this with your with just a simple phone so if i if i just I've got, a, got an iphone here but it's not particularly brand new one and so if i go for um uh, light levels so i've loaded up a light meter this is a piece of free software and uh, i can measure the light so let's do it so outside today i'm sitting in the, in the office in the garden and um I measure the light outside mm. and it's a and it's about 8,000 lux outside um, but if I measure it inside you know just the, the other side of the window I'm mm. uh, measuring the desk that you're talking to me on golly gosh it's poor oh, only 26 lux <laughs> <laughs> and you want you want 500 lux for the best possible thinking I've dimmed it down a bit because the camera works a little better yeah. in this poor light. But, um, you know, thousands of lux outside the window, 26 lux inside the window. Yeah. And uh, and again, the light's too low. People start to get dozy. And we, we had a brain measurably stops working as well. It's the same with movement. You need to move your body a little. So classrooms where you have to stay still the whole time, and not very good for your brain look here's um here's a functional mri scan of of two brains They're these and these are aggregates of students so the 20 students here 20 students here they're doing a test and before the test the group here have been told to um walk around just walk around the room chat to each other you know keep moving and keep moving your heart moves the blood goes around your brain whereas the other group over here have been told and probably as you've been told i certainly was when i was at school they're told okay it's a test sit down have a little calm moment collect your thoughts you know but you can see the color here is brain activity and you can see that the moving around is very good for your brain activity and we we make that movement in schools all sorts of ways i put a lot of slides in so these are slides in schools you can see these children here about to jump out of the window of their classroom they go down the slide and these slides are pretty steep you know they they go down three floors or more the um the yellow one here is the building i'm in right now i'm actually sitting in that building so i go out and go down the slide occasionally when i'm feeling a bit dozy <laughs> but all this adds up you know it all adds up to keeping your brain buzzing
which is what we're trying to do. Yeah, so I saw that in your research, you like to highlight the importance of color and light in schools. Uh, allow me to show a picture with my school, uh, Spectrum School uh, in Cluj, in Apoca. Uh, it's under uh, the supervision of my arts teacher. Um, and we painted our school and it looks quite nice. Uh, I'm lucky to be in a school that really cares about the students and the management is always open to suggestions. Can you give us your most effective and easy to implement tips to make our school an even better learning environment? Yeah, I can. And I mean, if you're painting, and it's lovely that you're a mm -hmm. teacher has been part of that, and everybody being part of it is good. And I like the fact she's kept the walls mostly very light and then just have sort of spot colour from the plants. So by and large, you want the walls to be white. And we use a paint called um, Space and Light paint, which has a very high level of reflection of paint. It's a Dulux Halka Nobel paint. And then, uh, and then you put the colour in a bit like behind you. You put the colour in with a couple of, you know, a little bit of blue or a stripe or a, maybe an LED light that change, changes colour. You know, but, but by and large, you want light to reflect off the walls. You're, just walk around with your light meter and just try and get it all up to 500 lux. You'll find that in break time, the children go and sit where it's light. They tend to go and sit in the light areas and their, their brains are just, uh, 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 just drawn to the light. But, um, you know, if you want your children to be, if you want your children to be quiet, put them in a very dark room and they'll all fall asleep, you know, but that's not, it's not very good for their learning. <laughs> so very light is really, is really good. And, you know, involving everybody in these things really helps. I mean, another thing, it's trivial, but a lot of schools, people stick paper on the windows. And uh, sometimes I think they just want the classroom to be a little more private, you know, or, or, but the windows are there because the architects were trying to let the light in. So you can do a really good thing and just go around the school, you know, set yourself up as a, um, you know, better learning team and go around the school and just take everything off the class everywhere. And don't throw it away because some of it's precious. Put it in a folder and leave it on the desktop and ask the cleaners say on a friday if there's anything left on the windows you please take it off so the classroom is ready for monday you know you'll, you'll see that lets a lot of light in you can do things like um just putting white paper on desks well up the my the desk i'm sitting in here it's got a black um surface if i just get a piece of piece of white paper some white paper and put it in front and then measure the the light levels with the white paper uh yeah i've gone from 27 to 180 um which is not 500 you know but at least having having light surfaces really help so there's all lots of little details i love the look of your school by the way and those i love the little spot colors by the window to, anything to make it interesting you know but don't put too much color in lots of white really really important yes great uh th that sounds really helpful uh these days we are having new cases of flu and uh, the government in romania recommends using the strong disinfectants in the class in all the classrooms again uh, some people may think that it's the best measure but after i read some of your work and listen to your interview i would like to find out more about these effects uh, that the that these disinfectants and their total volatile organic compounds have on learning yeah, so I mean, you're, you, you've done well to read that. It's really important. And VOCs, um, people watching this will recognize it when they, when they get a whiteboard pen, you know, take the top off. There's that sort of spirit smell, you know, and um, you get that also with um, cleaning compounds and you get it from carpet tiles because the, the tufts are glued onto the carpet tiles with a, with a type of glue. So we've been measuring those, um, TVOC is the total volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to try and see, here you can see, I think that's no, not a very good graph. It's scaled a bit, but this is, okay, it's okay. This, is the, this is the hour before school. And this thing that's shooting upwards is because the cleaners are using really quite aggressive cleaning materials. And, um, you know, they're really not doing the children any good at all. Um, but... It's really interesting, the whole infection thing, because um, 
you can't it's quite hard to get infected from your desk the 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 yeah. um, to be honest you could come in and lick your desk and it probably is not going to infect you the most of the infection is by aerosol transmission is by the little water droplets that are spread and they they kind of float through the atmosphere and um they're not very good for us and and you can get those down look i've done a here's a nice little illustration here this is um this is a class and we're looking at co2 here but co2 is about the same weight as those little infection droplets and what you see here are um uh, the 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 top line is a classroom with no doors or windows open and the minute you're out of the blue it's starting to be dangerous the um the purple and the dark blue line are they've opened the windows but of course because these aerosol droplets and co2 are heavy the top half of the classroom is okay the bottom half of the classroom is not so good but the bottom line you can only just just see it there that's windows and doors open so if you want to be safer from covid infection the first thing to do is to open doors and windows and let the let the air pass and if it's cold wear wear more coats you know it's really really simple um but the second thing that's quite important is to to have lids on your toilets and it turns out on the toilet if you shut the lid when you flush the toilet the little droplets stay in the toilet if you open the lid the droplets go about five meters five meters that's a long way and um and they're, they're full of infection so unless you're going to have people going to the toilet one at a time and then sort of wait five minutes and then the next person having a lid on the toilet really really important in spain we've done a huge amount of putting lids onto lots and lots of school toilets and it's really had a big impact on the infection rate and then the last thing I can tell you what we're doing, but I can't tell you the results. We're modeling the airflow around the classroom because something that happened with COVID was a lot of children were sat in rows facing the front, you know, that meter and a half between you, everybody's mm -hmm. safe, you know, I can't touch my friend and he's infected. But unfortunately, they're all breathing in the same direction. So you get like a kind of river of breath going through the classroom straight at the teacher and the poor old teacher your um your mr anna and all the others uh they're in a sort of river of infection and what what happened in many schools around the world is the teachers were more sick than any other profession and also a viral load so there's a lot of people breathing at them they they more often they were sick and they were more sick they were worse you know so we're modeling, we have a worker with a company who does the, the airflow in Formula One cars, so it's a lot of fun. But we're looking at airflow in different classrooms to see, I wonder what the best is. And I can tell you now, the best is not everybody sitting facing the same way. We're thinking it's probably four people facing each other and then another four, because you're only going to infect the other three, not the whole classroom. But we, I don't know yet. So we'll have that data somewhere around... Um, the end of May this year. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, you sort of keep watching the website. 20, 24 million people on the website last year. So there's a, a lot of people follow this stuff, you know. That's not a lot in TikTok terms, but it's for an old <laughs> professor, that's quite good. You know? <laughs> uh, so you work with many schools, governments, and organizations around the world. Uh, what do you think, uh, or better said, why do you think uh, things don't change for the better faster? Uh, what, what prevents us from having a good learning environment? Well, um, I think people have just got used to doing it the same way. And uh, I don't know um, about where you are, but I certainly know about um, England, the people who do haircuts. And the, my hair's a lot shorter than yours, so I've obviously had a, a haircut pretty recently. They have a pole outside, it's like a spiral, it's got red stripes going down it and that's yeah. quite universal you see that around the world quite a lot because a long time ago they used to think you could make people healthy by bleeding them if you weren't very well they would cut you 
and you'd bleed. And they had a chart, you know, if you if you bleed the earlobes or you bleed the arms or you bleed different places for different illnesses. And people who did the bleeding were the barbers because they had very sharp razors. So the pole actually represents the bandage and the blood. Uh, well, Interesting. when we realized that it didn't have any effect at all, <laughs> in fact, it killed people. Uh, we really, well, it's actually hygiene would be better, <laughs> you know, washing and, and the disinfecting, you know. Um, they kept on bleeding people for 50 years after we'd realized it didn't work. Because all bleeding is what we do, you know. I'm, I've got a pole outside my room. I'm, I do bleeding, you know. And so it just takes people a while to get their heads out of one place and another. That's why, fundamentally, I'm so pleased to be talking to you about all this because. I do believe it's the school students that, that can take hold of this. And yeah. you've seen the same with Greta Thunberg and, and climate change. There's a lot of really good activists in schools at the moment saying, hey, we can do this better. And it's much easier for you to look at the research and get things started and look at the sound of bringing the plants. Much easier than for an education minister or a politician who are usually, well, not very exciting people, really. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Happel. I uh, really appreciate uh, your time and your expertise. If you don't mind, I will keep you posted when our project uh, when uh, our project develops. I'd love to. I was going to ask anyway. I'd be really happy to do that. And if you want me to pop back in in a year or half a year and have a look at what's gone on, and um, I'll have a word with Monica and see if she's free, and we'll <laughs> we'll come. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, thank you for thank your you interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Genuinely. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Bye now. Bye.